So I will be taking you through conditions that cause abnormal bleeding. We all know that we all bleed when we have an injury. Uh, but what is necessary is to understand what is abnormal bleeding. Um, so bleeding, we all know, is attached to this particular pathway that we have learned from our MBBS days, uh, which is uh, the coagulation pathway of intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. Uh, we know that activation of coagulation happens uh, by either contact activation or release of tissue factor. Tissue factor will initiate the extrinsic pathway, which combines with factor 7a to activate factor 10. 10 uh, activated 10 will activate uh, prothrombin to thrombin, and while the contact pathway will activate uh, factor uh, 12 to 12a, which activates factor 11 to 11a, and that activates factor 9 to 9a, which combines with factor 8a to activate factor 10, and of course that is the generation of thrombin through the intrinsic pathway and we know that deficiency of factor 9 and 8 causes a severe bleeding disorder called uh, hemophilia A or hemophilia B uh, respectively and uh, uh, they definitely cause abnormal bleeding. So I will start with this lady, a uh, 45 year old lady who was uh, referred uh, by a uh, surgeon, uh, uh, cardiothoracic surgeon from Coimbatore because this lady was awaiting uh, coronary bypass uh, and uh, they found that the the APD was very high, more than 100 seconds. When uh, it was done in CMC2, it was 113 seconds, while the reference range for APT is 27.8 to 36.5 seconds, which is established in the laboratory itself. So obviously, this APD is quite prolonged. So what is APT? APD is the time taken by an anticoagulated citrate plasma to clot in the presence of negatively charged contact activator like silica, kaolin, elagic acid. In the presence of phospholipid, which is called the partial thromboplastin, that's why this uh, is called the activated partial thromboplastin time. And of course, calcium has to be added to recalcify the citrated plasma. So this uh, contact activator will activate factor 12. And of course, you have the intrinsic pathway being carried out in the formation of the clot, which is through thrombin. Uh, the uh, normal way to resolve the uh, APTT will be your time of the patient opting on the patient's plasma along with the reference range. Uh, some people like to compare it with that day's control time, but the standard says that please use it along with the um, reference range. Uh, some of the uh, hematologists, they like to use the ratio that is patient, uh, the time obtained on the patient's plasma divided by the normal plasma time. And any ratio of more than 1.2, which will be equivalent to 6 seconds more than the control time, will be indicating an abnormal or a prolonged APTT. And we know that a prolonged APTT can be because of the deficiency of the intrinsic pathway factors. That is factor 12, 11, 9, 8, uh, 10, 5, thrombin and 5, prothrombin and 5 notch. So this patient had also other tests done like prothrombin time, which, is, uh, which was 12 seconds and also a platelet count was done, which was normal. Uh, one like eighty-five thousand. Uh, what is prothrombin time? Prothrombin time is also uh, plasma clotting time, which is taken by recalcitrated plasma, recalcitrated citrate plasma to clot in the presence of tissue factor. So tissue factor will activate the extrinsic pathway. So it is basically measuring the extrinsic pathway. Tissue factor is nothing but thromboplastin, which has got a lot of negatively charged phospholipid attached to it. So what are the screening tests for hemostasis? There is platelet count. Bleeding time, which is checking the plasma, the platelet activity or platelet function analysis. Uh, prothrombin time, which looks after the extrinsic pathway factors. Activated partial thromboplastin time, which looks after the intrinsic pathway factors. So it covers fairly the entire area of coagulation. The, uh, in which the APD was found to be prolonged. So the goals of a pre-surgical hemostasis assessment is basically because of the worry that after inducing an injury to the patient during the surgery, uh, you have a bleeding that will start. So we are trying to identify who will have abnormal bleeding compared to just normal bleeding. So discrimination between normality and pathological bleeding or abnormal bleeding tendency is a significant challenge. Of course, differentiating between a severe and a mild bleeding disorders is very, very easy, but distinction between normal subjects and those with mild bleeding disorders is often unclear. So what happens in a lab when you have a prolonged APTT? So we do a test called, uh, before doing the test, we actually find out whether the sample was collected properly. 
because one of the most common cause of a prolonged lepidity is a bad sample collection. So the most common cause of abnormal lepidity is uh, the, the bad sample collection. So you have to basically look at time of sample collection versus time of analysis. Uh, then sample collection itself, whether the long procedure was followed. Most of the hospitals now in India are now collecting samples in the evacuated tube. Uh, so it uses an evacuated tube system. So evacuated tubes, always you need to uh, collect samples using an evacuated tube system, which is the... Evacuated tube system is total collection because the sample comes directly in touch with the anticoagulant as soon as it comes out of the way. Most of the people try to use, tend to use syringe and needle method. Uh, only problem is how do, how do you transfer the blood in the syringe into the tubes? Most of the people open the caps of the evacuated tube, converting the evacuated tube system into normal tubes because the vacuum is gone. And they transfer the blood from the syringe into the tubes. You must realize that opening the cap of an evacuated tube increases the chance of compromising the integrity of primary sample. Never open the cap of the tube if you are using evacuated tube system. Of course, many people don't use evacuated tube system, but at that time they take that care of collecting the sample properly by transferring the sample from the syringe of the tube into the anticoagulant within one minute of the draw of the sample. So if you take that much care, no problem. But just because you have evacuated tube system doesn't give you the guarantee that opening the cap may give you a good sample. So. Um, so when we have an abnormal APTT, generally we call the uh, system as the collecting, the blood collecting system, maybe from the ward or from our own laboratory where the sample was collected properly. Then after the, um, that is verified that the sample was collected properly, uh, you must realize that uh, the, uh, a test is done, which is actually the most important test in a coagulation laboratory. This test is mandatory to hospitals which manage patients who are likely to have abnormal bleeding or any form of bleeding uh, because this test will tell you whether the patient is bleeding because of any particular uh, disorder. And that test is called the mixing studies. It's also called correction studies because we are trying to correct an abnormal APTT or find out the reason why the, uh, to correct an abnormal APTT. So how is, how is mixing studies done? It's basically very simple. You mix equal volumes of the uh, plasma which gave the abnormal time with normal plasma. Uh, ideally, we must use a control pool plasma where all factors will be uh, in close to 100%. That means normal quantity. So that's why you pool some people's plasma because some single plasma may not be, single, single normal plasma may not be uh, the right one. So you pool some plasmas and then you call the control pool plasma. So you mix that with abnormal plasma in equal volumes and repeat the S which was abnormal like in this patient, the A period was abnormal. The rationale of this test is that if the prolongation in time is due to deficiency of factor in the test plasma, the normal plasma will provide the deficient factor on mixing and therefore it corrects the prolonged time. So it indicates that there was a deficiency of a factor. But if the prolongation in time is due to an inhibitor, like the patient may be on heparin or there may be an antibody to a factor, the normal plasma will also be inhibited and the prolonged time will remain prolonged. So correction of time which was abnormal in the patient plasma after mixing will indicate deficiency of factor, but no correction will indicate the patient has got an antibody to a, a factor or maybe on heparin. Most common cause of uh, no, non-correction is heparin, lupus anticoagulant, uh, factor inhibitor, and large amounts of FTPs and D-dimer. This correction study has direct interpretation to therapy. So just, just imagine if you have a patient who is bleeding in the theater, has a prolonged APTT, Correction of time by mixing studies will mean that with normal plasma means that if you supply the normal plasma uh, to the patient, which, uh, the, which contains a deficient factor or transfuse FFP, the clotting defect which prolong the time will get corrected and the bleeding will stop. So that is the importance of mixing studies. Without mixing studies, you cannot transfuse anybody. Non-correction of time, which is an important information, will tell you that there is no point in transfusing FFPs. Instead, identify what the cause could be and use safer products like uh, heparin in the case, I mean, protamine in the case, if it was heparin that was identified. And if it's an inhibitor, use other agents. So coming back to my patient who had an APD of 113 seconds, prothrombin time was normal. Uh, platelet count in the CBC was normal. Bleeding time was normal. Mixing studies showed that the patient's normal plasma showed complete correction of the prolonged APTT, which was 32.3 seconds, which now gives me an indication that this patient has got a factor deficiency. 
So which factor? Because PT was normal, we are looking at the factor in the APTD pathway. That is factor 12, 11, 9, 8. The APTD pathway has 10 prothrombin and fibrinogens, so common pathway factors, we don't worry. So this prolonged APTD would be either a deficiency of factor 12, 11, 9 or 8, since prothrombin time was normal. So I did an assay on this patient, all these factors, intrinsic pathway factors, and we found that the factor 8 was 283 percent, normal is 50 to 150, so it's quite high. Factor 9 was also high, 175 international units per deciliter or 175 percent. Factor 12 was also uh, normal, 75 percent, but factor 11 was absent, it's less than 1 percent, so we have a severe deficiency of factor 11. So this patient in the old days would have been called as severe hemophilia C because factor 11 deficiency was called as hemophilia C. So they also have a bleeding tendency. So what is the screening test for hemostasis? Plated count, bleeding time, PT and APTD. But there is one more test which is the most important test in the field of hemostasis and that is HIST. This patient has no past, 45 year old lady, has no past or present history of bleeding. She had two full-term normal deliveries and there was no transfusion that were required. So we may uh, think that you know uh, the history taking must have been very poor, but nowadays there is uh, a very objective way of taking history, which is called the bleeding assessment tool, uh, whereby you have this questionnaire uh, in which uh, you have all the bleeding symptoms like epistaxis, bleeding from minor wounds, uh, oral cavity bleeding, GI bleeding uh, listed and the severity that is, you know, whether it was just seen, uh, whether it's the, the patient consulted a doctor because the bleeding was slightly more severe or sometimes the bleeding was more severe and therefore it required any intervention by the clinician and of course the next severity is bleeding was so severe that blood transfusion was required. So all the bleeding symptoms are listed here, like menorrhagia and of course uh, hematrosis, CNS bleeding and a score of uh, four or more than four in an adult male, score of six or more than six in an adult female, especially those who have menorrhagia as a symptom and three or more than three for a child is considered to be a bleeder with almost a negative predictive value of or lower values of 99.6%. So let's look at how you apply this bleeding assessment tool. So we have an 18-year-old female. I'll just highlight her symptoms. She's got epistaxis and uh, oral bleed since the last five years and for which she has been taking tranexamic acid. So she was referred to rule out platelet type disorder or von Willebrand's disease. So applying her bleeding tool, she has epistaxis for which uh, she had an antifibrinolytic agent. So what is the bleeding score? Bleeding score is three. Is she a bleeder or not a bleeder? So you must remember that she's a uh, adult female, 18 years old. And uh, for an adult, a score of four or more than four is considered to be a bleeder. So this will be a, not a bleeder as far as the bleeding assessment tool, but she was referred to the lab for identifying whether she has got mild von Willebrand's disease or platelet function disorders. We, in such type of patients, we have to do so many tests because the clinician has referred the patient. But if the clinician had used the bleeding assessment tool, may not have referred this patient. And finally, we come out with a diagnosis of no intrinsic hemostatic defect, which even the bleeding assessment tool did identify. Uh, for patients who have got menorrhagia, you have got known as what is known as the pictorial bleeding assessment chart, uh, where you can even allow the patient to score uh, based on the number of um, uh, the uh, pads that were used for the menorrhagia. So here we have um, a two-year-old boy uh, who was brought to the emergency uh, department for oozing blood from his mouth following a fall six hours back. Uh, she has, he has also had prolonged um, uh, um, uh, bleedings from his uh, immunization site and he has bleeding following trivial uh, trauma which required suturing. So if you look at his bleeding assessment tool, bleeding from minor wounds requiring surgical hemostasis. So bleeding score of three. So this is a child who has got a bleeding score of three and in a child a bleeding score of three or more than three is considered to be a bleeder and the final diagnosis was mild von Willebrand's disease. So bleeding assessment tool can be very objective assessment of bleeding history. So coming back to my patient who has severe factor 11 deficiency, there was no history of bleeding at all. So 
if you look at this particular pathway that we had intrinsic and extrinsic pathway we should assume that factor 11 deficiency absence of factor 11 will not generate thrombin and there's a likelihood of bleeding in this patient but this patient has never bled in her entire life now in this uh, picture i'm trying to show those two people who two groups which actually published this uh, pathway the extrinsic pathway was published by robert mcfarlane from oxford and that's a picture that he got of him he got interested in the extrinsic pathway because his father died of a Brussels viper venom bite and um, uh, that we know that Russell's Viper activates factor 10 to 10A and that's how he got interested in the coagulation system and he described the extrinsic pathway to us. For the intrinsic pathway, um, we have uh, the picture here which was described by the group from Dave, Oscar, uh, Oscar Ratnoff and Davey from Cleveland. And in that picture you see Oscar Ratnoff collecting blood from a gentleman called John Higman. And we know what Higman, John Higman is. This particular gentleman did not have any factor 12. He had severe deficiency of factor 12. You can see that he's not that young. Uh, this picture was taken a week before he died of a, a pulmonary embolism following an accident. Uh, and interestingly, he has never bled in his life. Yeah, and later on, it was found out that he had episodes of deep vein thrombosis and he died of pulmonary embolism. So question raised is why does factor 12 deficiency not bleed. So this guy has never bled in his life. So factor 12 deficiency has does not cause bleeding was later on identified. And coming back to my patient, factor 11 deficiency has also not been, is also not a bleeder. But we have also identified patients who have got factor 11 deficiency may not be as severe as this lady, maybe 2%, maybe 5%, maybe 11% who actually have bleeding symptoms. So factor 11 deficiency is known to cause variable symptoms, no bleeding to severe bleeding. So, uh, interestingly, I uh, was looking at the names, I mean, the publication that these paper published. One group published it uh, in, uh, like, uh, Oxford published it in Nature and uh, Oscar Ratnoff published it in Science. One of them called it as the Cascade and other one called it as a Waterfall. So, you can make a good guess which one was, a, which one is the extrinsic, is the extrinsic pathway of the Waterfall or Cascade or the intrinsic pathway of the Waterfall or Cascade. It's easy for us to look at the picture, but later on I found out that the intrinsic pathway was called the waterfall and the extrinsic pathway was called the cascade. So coming back to the issue that factor, obviously people start questioning this pathway because the factor 12 deficiency does not cause bleeding, factor 11 causes uh, variable symptoms. And also the question was raised is that we know that deficiency of factor 9 and 8 causes severe bleeding disorders called hemophilia A or hemophilia B. But why should these people bleed when they can actually generate a clot through the extrinsic pathway? So that was a big question that was asked. So answers started coming in the mid uh, 80s, early 80s by the, the discovery of the fact that uh, tissue factor extrinsic pathway along with factor 7 can activate factor 9 in addition to factor 10. And a discovery of a very important protein called the uh, tissue factor pathway inhibitor, uh, which is uh, TFPI, it inhibits or blocks the further action of tissue factor and factor 7A. Uh, so what happens is when 10A is generated by the tissue factor, it combines with TFPI and comes and blocks the extrinsic pathway. So the, no more further contribution will be happening from the extrinsic pathway. So answers started coming in the form of a new pathway, which is called the cell-based theory of hemostasis. That is all coagulation process occurs on the surface of tissue factor bearing cell either the endothelial cell, platelets, or monocytes. And they came out with three steps, initiation, amplification, and propagation. So you can see that uh, the initiation is just the uh, exposure of tissue factor. Tissue factor is usually hidden between this, uh, the phospholipid bilayer. Not, a, not even a small part of the tissue factor is exposed, but so when, it, when it's exposed, it immediately activates a coagulation. So you can see here that as soon as it's exposed, the combines with factor 7A and, and activates factor 9 to 9A and 10 to 10A. This 10A uh, will find a little bit of prothrombin near it and activates prothrombin to thrombin. So it produces a very small amount of th thrombin. This thrombin is of no use, but what this thrombin does is it actually... Uh, initiates the amplification pathway by activating the platelets and in the platelets it activates the factor 5 to 5a because the platelet contains factor 5a, I mean factor 5. Uh, the platelets also contain one Willebrand factor which carries the factor 8 so it activates factor 8 to 8a and factor platelets contain a little amount of factor 9 and converts 9 to 9a. 
So this activated 5 and 5A allow the formation of two important uh, complexes, which is called the tennis complex and the prothrombinase complex. Uh, the tennis complex is basically because the substrate is factor 10 and the factor 8A allows factor 9 to activate factor 10 to 10A. Uh, while the prothrombinase complex, the substrate is prothrombin, the uh, enzyme is factor 10A, but factor 5A brings 10A close to factor uh, 2 so that it allows the activation of factor 2 to 2A. At the end of this particular step, a lo lot of thrombin is produced, almost 100,000 molecules of thrombin is produced. But just to make sure that it is 100,000 and not less, the system has created another step called the propagation. You remember the factor 11 that was activated by thrombin. That 11, uh, 11A will activate factor 9 to 9A. And then you have the tennis complex forming, the prothrombin is complex forming. So, and it produces some more thrombin. So this ensures that definitely more than 100,000 molecules of thrombin is produced. So now you can see that uh, it's not very much different from the old pathway. The initiation is nothing but the old intrinsic pathway, but with factor 9 involved. Amplification, nothing but the old common pathway with additional participation fact from factor 9 and factor 5. And propagation is nothing but the old intrinsic pathway with no factor 12 at all. So the answer is no role for factor 12 in coagulation. And you can see the sheer importance of factor 9 and factor 8. Without factor 9 and factor 8, you will not get amplification at all. And that's why the patients bleed a lot. The cell surface helps localize the clot formation. And you can see that at the end of amplification, that is the, uh, the, the uh, amplification step, where 100,000 molecules of thrombin is produced. If it guarantees that 100,000 molecules are produced, what is the role for propagation? There is no role for propagation because all the molecules of thrombin are produced from the amplification step. So there's no role for propagation. If there is no role for propagation, and what is the uh, enzyme in propagation? Factor 11A. So there is lesser role for factor 11A if amplification does all the job. So for completing the coagulation system, just imagine this a blood vessel where all the coagulation factors are uh, in, more, uh, in circulation. They're all in the inactive form. So you can see the factor 8 being carried by von Willebrand's factor. And all these coagulation factors will be uh, coming out through the uh, injury site. Now, all we require is that something should hold these coagulation factors and platelets at the site of injury so that the coagulation can take. So something has to hold them. Otherwise, they'll be keeping on flowing out from the site of injury. So let's magnify this. So just imagine if it's arterial bleeding, all of them will fly out. So just to magnify this, there's a platelet which is being carried out by the flow of blood outside. Somebody should hold this platelet at the site of injury uh, so that they can start clotting. And then now, of course, the, endo the uh, subendothelial collagen is also exposed. So something has to hold this platelet. And that is done by this large protein called von Willebrand's factor. It's a very large protein which is found circulating in the blood and coiled form. Uh, it needs to get activated. And what you see down is activation. It rolls out like a carpet when it, it sees exposed uh, uh, collagen. So what happens is the in the coil, the inside part of the coil is actually the uh, activated part of the, uh, the active part of the von Willebrand's factor which binds to platelets. Usually it is hidden in the coil. It, it cannot be exposed. And then A3 part, which is the outside part of von Willebrand's factor, has an affinity for collagen. So now you can see that when the collagen finds collagen, I mean, when uh, the von Willebrand's factor finds collagen, the A3 part will start attaching to collagen one by one, allowing the von Willebrand's factor to roll out like a carpet and expose the um, active part, which binds the platelet. So now you can see that the platelets are being taken with the flow of blood. It suddenly finds something it likes, tries to bind. But every time it tries to bind, the flow of blood takes it away one by one. But every time it tries to bind, it develops resistance to the flow that finally it can have enough resistance to stop, resist the flow and get activated in the process. So just imagine if the von Willebrand's factor was not long enough, by the time the platelet is able to develop resistance to the flow, it goes off and the bleeding will continue. So this happens in a very uh, qualitative type of platelet, von Willebrand's disease called type 2A, where there's absence of high molecular multimers. So you must remember, remember that von Willebrand's factor will be only functional if the entire multimers are normally present and in normal form. So let's see the platelets are able to resist the flow of blood, stop, get active. and activates those platelets and allows the platelet aggregation to happen through the uh, glycoprotein 2B3A and fibrinogen. And it allows the formation of the primary hemostatic plug. 
Now this primary hemostatic plug is uh, not stable, so it requires stability, and that stability is a cemented a cemented stability is brought in from the in the form of fibrinogen getting converted to fibrin. So coming back to my patient, no past or present history of bleeding. Uh, so um, the issue is if history is so good and allows a patient to be identified as a bleeder or a non-bleeder, why don't people just use history alone? So the issue again is inadequacy of history by a physician, but that can be overcome by the using the bleeding assessment tool. Then of course the unreliable patient who is not able to give proper history, and sometimes even a, a poor a person, I mean a person who does not elicit history properly. And one of the most common uh, history that is missed out is that uh, there will be uh, increase uh, tooth extraction bleeding from tooth extraction will usually be missed by the. Uh, a person taking history or even the historian tonsillectomy bleeding because everybody thinks that anyway we bleed from but abnormal bleeding is usually ignored so this is a uh, symptom that is usually missed then of course you must appreciate that there are certain uh, disorders which can bleed only when the knife is put like mild factor 11 deficiency or factor 7 deficiency but these are all mild factor deficiencies then acquired disorders like acquired hemophilia a may not present till uh, uh, the surgery happens so these things are, have to be appreciated, uh, but the bat usually overcomes all this. And if you can do use a bat and a short the short history bat with a PT and APDT, which can identify the mild disorders as well as the acquired bleeding disorders like acquired hemophilia A, we can possibly identify patients who may have abnormal bleeding. So coming back to my patient, you see how much factor eight she had, how much factor nine she had. And now if you look at apply these numbers to the pathway, the new pathway, you can see that her factor 8 and factor 9 was so high that she was producing not 100,000 molecules at the end of amplification, but almost 200 to 400,000 molecules of thrombin. She never required propagation. So her factor 11 was not required at all during her life. So, um, so what we did was when we sent the patient back as a accountable accountable uh, hematologist, we decided that we have to write a report, not just factor 11 deficiency. We said that this patient will not bleed during surgery. And for that, we did thrombin generation test in which we found that patient produces large amounts of thrombin. And uh, so that report was com quite comprehensive. And we even said that the patient will not bleed during surgery. So after reading the report, you know what the surgeons did? They ordered four FFPs. So now, how did I get to know about it? Because the anesthetist uh, for the surgery who was actually trained here previously, she called from Coimbatore and said that should she transfuse the FFP before a particular test that they do called the activated clotting time or um, should uh, or should she uh, transfuse, transfuse the FFP and then do ACT or do ACT, find the baseline and uh, transfuse the FFP. So I said, why FFP? They have ordered the FFP. So I said that don't um, transfuse the FFP, uh, just thaw it and keep it. Uh, the best judge of abnormal bleeding is the surgeon, and of course, it's an experienced surgeon. If they see, if they say that the field is, I mean, if there is abnormal bleeding, they will tell you. Then you can transfuse the FFP. So that uh, she called me later and said that uh, the FFPs were discarded because it was not required. The surgeons were uh, very happy with the field. So one thing I realized that. Abnormal bleeding is identified when the abnormal bleeding is seen. But when we do the test, are we trying to identify those people who are potentially abnormal bleeders? You know, I, I learned a lesson from this is that the tests are done so that the surgeons can have a clear field. So it is for the clear field that we are doing the test and not to identify a potential abnormal bleeder. Abnormal breeder will definitely have history. So one thing I realized that all these tests are done for identifying patients who will develop a clear field for the surgeon. In the scenario, we have, uh, uh, I think I may have, uh, how many more minutes, uh, Dr. Uh, Sudha? Uh, yes, sir, you have about um, 20 minutes. Is it okay? Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, so I have got another patient here. Uh, this is a lady who had acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Uh, she was bleeding very severely of, uh, with coagulopathy after delivery. Uh, 
She was given eight red cells, eight FFPs, 21 units of cryoprecipitate, 16 units of platelets, and seven separate monitoring of PT, APTT, fibrinogen, hemoglobin, and platelet count. And finally, you know, when you look at the results, now we can say that patient is no longer coagulopathic laboratory-wise because the PT is 12.1, APTT is 28 seconds, fibrinogen is 155, the hemoglobin is 9.1, and platelet count was 65,000. So you can look at the results, very clear that none of them will cause abnormal bleeding because platelet count of more than 50,000 definitely is uh, not a bleeder. But why is she continuing to bleed despite all these tests as being normal? So does clinical management create another acquired coagulopathy? I wouldn't say iatrogenic, but uh, yes, there is. Uh, there could be an acquired coagulopathy. And why are these tests not reflecting clinical bleeding? So we, we know that the uh, you know, PT and APTT, uh, which represent the old extrinsic and intrinsic pathway, is not exactly representing the uh, coagulation process. Then we also know that pregnancy is a totally different coagulation scenario compared to normal state. Pregnancy is a transient hypercoagulable state where all procoagulant factors, especially fibrinogen, von Willebrand's factor and factor 8 are very high. Some of the natural anticoagulants are low. Uh, there is increase in fibrinolysis. And what are these changes for? Are they to protect the baby or to protect the lady? I mean, the uh, lady. Yes, it is to protect the lady. Because during normal delivery, there's a huge risk of hemorrhage. Because you must remember, from the between the placenta removal and the tone coming back, we have a raw area, which a large raw area, which can bleed like anything. So this coagulation factors are basically developed are very high to stop the bleeding when the tone comes back. So, uh, so of course, obstetric hemorrhage has different etiologies. Most common cause of um, obstetric hemorrhage is uh, uterine atony, the tone not coming back. Uh, and of course, a little bit of a uh, few cases of some uh, trauma in the uh, tract, uh, which uh, may not be seen, uh, obviously. So these are the most common cause of obstetric hemorrhage. Of course, DIC and all those things are very rare. So what is postpartum hemorrhage? 100, uh, 500 ml of blood loss within 24 hours of vaginal delivery or 100,000 ml of blood loss within 24 hours of cesarean. Of course, uh, we must also know that blood loss, blood loss assessment should be uh, very uh, objective and not just seeing the drain and uh, getting an uh, alarm. Uh, some way you can look at hemoglobin concentration drop of 4 grams can be an indicator of this uh, blood loss. Of course, massive PPH is when the blood loss is more than 2.5 liters. Um, then why are the tests normal in these patients? You know, a study which showed uh, in patients with PPH, uh, most of the patients who were studied, their uh, PT and APTT was normal till the blood loss or blood loss reaches reached 5 liters. So, PT and APTT is not an indicator of uh, a coagulopathy in a patient who has got PPH. And then, of course, there are other precondi impaired preconditions like acidosis, especially in patients in intensive care, because we know that low pH can decrease the uh, coagulation uh, efficiency, hypocalcemia because of a lot of transfusion of uh, citrate uh, blood, uh, like FFP, they all contain a lot of citrate. Uh, and, of course, other um, fluids that are given to the patient. <laughs> Then low hematocrit, I will come to that later, and hypothermia. Hypothermia because we know that all coagulation functions happen at um, 37 degrees centigrade. So you must remember that hematocrit is, uh, or red cells also help in coagulation. If the hematocrit is normal, the platelets are pushed to the sides of the blood vessel so that it can reach the site of injury very fast and also help in clotting. If the hematocrit is low, all the platelets are in the center and they are not able to efficiently reach the site of bleeding. And therefore, the bleeding may continue. So, uh, hematocrit um, of 30% uh, is mandatory to allow for good platelet function. So, hematocrit of 30% will be a close to a hemoglobin between 9 and 10. And in our lady, the hemoglobin was 9.1. So, so please, maintain, if you have a slight ooze, please make sure that the hematocrit is more than 30%. Hypothermia. Uh, is also very important to note because the sample is sent. They will not tell you how much the temperature of the patient is because uh, all the tests in the laboratory are done at 37 degrees centigrade and not at the temperature the patient has. And when we do the test, we may actually be 
uh, overestimating the hemostatic competency of the patient rather than uh, the uh, incompetency because of low temperature. So this has to be kept in mind when doing the test. So we have this uh, lady who has uh, uh, no other impairments, no, I mean, all clotting system was normal. Then we look at fibrinogen. Uh, we realize that fibrinogen levels are very important for normal pregnancy. And when the, uh, between the placenta coming out and the tone coming back, the fibrinogen levels from 600 can fall, now, fall, fall to less than 200 in very short time. So if the fibrinogen is less than 200 milligrams per deciliter, it has a positive predictive value of severe PPH. So fibrinogen of less than 200 uh, is not allowed to happen when the, uh, when the tone comes back. And if it is less than 200, it may go on to uh, major complications for the patient, including uh, ligation of the artery, hysterectomy, and sometimes level 3 intensive care. So the fibrinogen has to be maintained at 200. So that was the message that uh, I wanted to pass on. That is, in PPH, the fibrinogen has to be measured, and it has to be measured by the one-clause method and no other method. So one-clause method fibrinogen of 200 is a predictor of poor outcome in uh, like, you know, uh, many times uh, when the patient is uh, bleeding, in the, you know, immediately they call the blood bank and said that, uh, you know, can you send us FFP and you have the shock pack uh, protocols, that is one pack cell, one FFP, one platelets. You must realize that shock packs can be very dangerous in pregnancy uh, because shock packs have been decided by trauma people and not by PPH people. Uh, so disadvantage of unmonitored shock pack transfusion is that um, you must realize that the patient is actually having normal coagulation factors and platelets at the time. When you transfuse this, you may be diluting out the coagulation factors. So you must realize that a lady who is pregnant, she may be having a, a fibrinogen of 500, 400, 300. And when you transfuse FFP where fibrinogen is 150, you may be diluting the fibrinogen off. So finally, we realized that this lady's fibrinogen was 155. We gave her a full dose of prior precipitate and she never bled again. So you must realize that guidelines have to be understood properly and uh, unnecessary transfusion should be avoided and proper guide, uh, proper measurement of coagulation has to be undertaken. So transfuse to correct only when an abnormal bleeding is evidenced, uh, easy in facility which have blood and blood products with inside. Good to know what is to correct uh, because you have four choices only, red cells, FFPs, platelets and cryos. Uh, we must realize that hemostasis changes in liver disease actually tilt towards hypercoagulable state, but all measuring systems will show that patient is hypocoagulable. So that also has to be uh, appreciated. Uh, products, especially FFP, will have lesser factors than the patient. So the risk of diluting the hemostatic potential of the patient or dilution of coagulopathy is, poss is, a, uh, is a possibility. So most common cause of unmonitored transmission of shock packs is a, a bad outcome for postpartum hemorrhage. So there will be some other patient factors which I want to bring to your attention. Uh, you know, I have a small anticoagulation follow-up on some patients. So this is a patient who is in Darjeeling. Poor lady has to come down to Siliguri to do her uh, uh, anticoagulation uh, tests for INR because she's on warfarin. And uh, uh, after the results, she sends me her results and I advise her whether to continue on the same dose or not. Uh, so this mail came uh, from her and that is today her INR is 4.42. Uh, because she has got uh, double valve, her uh, target INR is between uh, 2.5 to 3.5. So this is slightly high and she was taking 2 milligrams. So I immediately uh, wrote to her that it's a bit high. Have you been well? Are you taking any antibiotics? Then the second question was, has the mango season started in your place? And are you having a lot of mangoes? Please reply to this mail. Skip this evening's dose and restart at 2 milligrams tomorrow. And please check the INR on Saturday. So then she uh, uh, sends a reply that um, uh, she uh, took two milligrams yesterday and she has two, three to four mangoes in a day. Uh, the issue was, can't I have mangoes? Please let me know if I'm not supposed to have them. And then she also mentioned last week I had antibiotics for sore throat and cold. You must realize that antibiotics in a patient with uh, has to be very carefully administered in a patient who's taking warfarin because the, the intestinal flora is destroyed, which produces a little bit of vitamin K, which balances the uh, so when the uh, antibiotic given, all the vitamin K source is lost and therefore the uh, it enhances the effect of the warfarin. That's why I, INR went to 4.42 and please remember, she also mentioned that she developed a hemorrhagic cyst. 
but you know if that's why the clinicians have to be very careful when they uh, administer something they should know if there are any other drugs the patient is on anyway so uh, so I, this was a good answer good uh, reply that she gave because i realized that was because of the antibiotics are inr and bergona so i replied to her is that uh, thanks for your reply inr is a bit high because of the antibiotic now that it is stopped you should be fine so don't stop the medicine continue 2 mg and no need to skip today uh, there is no problem with mangoes but people who usually have mangoes have lesser vegetables and salad so this was a big study that was done in uh, in uh, baroda uh, by uh, tushar toprani and viren but they mentioned uh, they uh, found out that during the mango season a person who has two mangoes every day the inr goes up slightly high person who has four mangoes it is higher a person who has 10 mangoes it's it's almost like directly proportional to the man number of mangoes you take so then the reply uh, to that was that the, most of the people in gujarat are vegetarians and they have a lot of uh, vegetables and vegetables are a good source of vitamin k so when you have mangoes you have lesser vegetables because the space of uh, vegetables are taken up by the mangoes so please don't compromise on the vegetable intake so you can have as many mangoes as you want but do not have lesser vegetables and salads as you are having before so that was a very interesting uh, episode so patient factors are very important to identify abnormal bleeding so my final statement is hemostasis equals love everyone talks about it but nobody understands it thank you very much sir excellent excellent session i don't have any words to describe the way you have uh, uh, told us how to approach a case of bleeding and you have started right from the basics and you have gone to the most difficult and uh, most interesting cases excellent excellent and i think it's an eye opener for all the pgs and for the clear for the others who are consultants who are listening also sir we have a few questions Mm. Okay. Anas, uh, why is hemophilia? Why in hemophilia the extrinsic pathway doesn't compensate to prevent bleeding? That is one of the questions. Ah, okay. Ah, uh, what was the question? Can you say that again? Why in hemophilia the extrinsic pathway doesn't compensate to prevent bleeding? Ah. Oh, that's because of tissue factor pathway. Uh, yes. uh, tissue factor pathway inhibitor. as i explained uh, in yes, fact uh, it's very interesting that you asked question. yeah because you know uh, it's very interesting that you asked a question nowadays uh, people are trying to see how you can use the extensing pathway to stop bleeding in uh, hemophilia one is novo 7 which is almost 100000 uh, times dose of five uh, activated factor 7 which uh, which produces lot more of uh, uh, it overcomes the existing tfpi in the patient the other one is trying to block tfpi by producing an antibody which actually blocks tfpi allowing more thrombin to be generated by the extrinsic path okay and uh, what is a good correction in a mixing studies is there a cut off yeah so thing is you know there are a lot of uh, indexes uh, which describe that but you know for me uh, a, a good correction um, in a in a patient who is who are being tested for uh, surgery or will be a complete correction within the it should come within the reference range of the aptt but a patient who is uh, in the hospital bleeding surgery there are a lot of other confounding factors which can interfere so anything which will be coming closer to the reference range for me is a good correction thank you sir and one final question why factor 12 deficiency doesn't cause bleeding but deficiency of factor 11 causes mild bleeding yeah so that was explained by the new pathway yes. of why yes uh, why factor okay. is not bleeding yes. yeah this, this was this were the questions which came up in the chat box okay. from the uh, audience and uh, if there are no more questions so thank you very much once okay. again and um, the story about the mangoes was really interesting and it was an eye opener <laughs> too and um, there is a question about uh, um, in dengue in dengue fever the yeah. hematocrit is more and platelets are low yeah. so is uh, can you because you were talking about hematocrit and uh, the yeah. platelets getting adhered uh, so is there yeah. any explanation for this yeah so thing is uh, you know when the uh, thrombocytopenia happens in dengue uh, uh, it will the bleeding that 
is resultant from uh, in dengue is not exactly because of low platelet count. There are other uh, issues too that uh, cause the bleeding. Uh, because you know in dengue uh, there is thrombocytopenia, but most of the platelets are large young platelets. They are hemostatically far more competent, and of course hematocrit uh, will definitely help. But uh, that is mainly because of the um, uh, dehydration. Um, but uh, the fact is that uh, because there is bleeding, people may have a tendency to transfuse platelets. Uh, sometimes, you know, what happens is transfusing platelets uh, alone in patients with dengue can actually worsen the clinical scenario because these platelets will be recruited into the areas where endorgan damage is happening, where the platelet microthrombi is being formed. So it can worsen the endorgan damage. So uh, please be careful when you're transfusing platelets in dengue. It may be a good idea to transfuse two FFPs along with the uh, platelets to reduce the um, the recruitment of platelets into uh, platelet microthrombi. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. And I think now the treatment protocol for dengue also has changed and uh, no longer uh, they rush into giving uh, platelets. Uh, so thank you very much, sir. Okay.